Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time thanks to your generous support, shares and views with multiple uploads every week to help share in the rich history of monsters, locations and mythologies of D&D. Classic dungeon crawl monster today straight from the monster manual. The Grick came to us first in the pages of the monster manual for third edition back in 2000. Has it only been 18 years? Gosh, seems like time has flown. Since then it has been developed a little bit more with the addition of the powerful Grick Alpha. However, as far as I am aware, no detailed ecology article has ever been published on these creatures. I could be wrong. So unless something more official gets published or has been published, let's give this creature a bit more detail and explain some of the more unusual properties of the Grick. First of all, the Grick is a relatively simple ambush predator that can be encountered on the surface world but is normally found underground, almost always in rocky terrain. They are drawn to areas where prey is plentiful, where they find nooks and crannies, caves and burrows to hide in until prey draws near. They are not intelligent creatures, they don't work well together as a, well they they don't work together cohesively as a pack with communication and such, and are quickly deterred by any sort of damage that actually hurts them. However, they are extremely rubbery and strangely put together, with organs distributed throughout their worm-like body. Bludgeoning, slashing and piercing attacks from non-magical weapons have no effect on these creatures, so they are quite a problem for those who are not prepared to fight them. Particularly miners and communities of troglodytes, kobolds, goblins, mites, sniads, zvarts, germalane, grimlocks and other underdark dwelling folk. If they know what they are about to fight, a few flasks of flammable oil, alchemical fire, acid or cold are quite effective at killing gricks or driving them off and even simple enchanted weapons make short work of them. But they are pretty ferocious and they tend to spring out of nowhere, inflicting savage wounds in mere moments. Gricks have both male and female reproductive organs. They typically cluster around a larger Grick Alpha and it is the Alpha that releases a chemical signal that instigates a mating cycle in all the other Gricks, usually in an area where food and shelter is optimal and can support a larger population. This is an entirely instinctual behaviour and it is a signal that uh, to leave, um, there's also a signal that the Grick Alpha le puts out to leave a poor or dangerous area triggered by the release of certain chemicals from, uh, f for instance, dying Gricks. So dwarves and Snurfeblin will often collect dead Gricks and use them to drive off other Gricks where the corpses are still fresh enough to release the triggering chemicals. Otherwise, the Gricks are aware when others of their kind are starving to death and dying around them so that they, that gives them a signal to leave. Gricks join end to end during mating and they can do this once every 7 to 10 weeks in optimal conditions. Each Grick then produces a slime sack containing 4 to 8 eggs which hat hatch after about 4 to 10 weeks. The temperature of the area plays some role in how long this takes. The colder it is, the longer it takes for the eggs to hatch, so it's possible that one could keep, be kept almost frozen for some time. Also, Gricks tend to lay eggs as soon as they enter a new food rich area, so they seem to be able to store the eggs and just fertilize and release them at a later time. The hatchlings grow to their adult breeding size of about 5 feet within a matter of a few months. They have a body of 3 feet long and 2 feet long tentacles, of which there are usually four, sometimes more, surrounding a beak-like mouth with a tongue. The body is quite simple, segmented like an earthworm, very tough and very strong. An average human has little chance, even of one of the smaller just juvenile, juvenile size gricks, of getting free of one of these things if it coils around and grabs hold of them. And the wickedly sharp serrated barbs at the end of the sucker tentacles are quite capable of tearing an ordinary human apart. Simple miners and prospectors will be quick to show off some of the scars a close encounter with a grick can leave behind, in the form of great torn wounds across the back as they latch on and tear into someone attempting to pull them into their beak like a punching dagger. Within a year, a Grick will be full adult size, about 8 feet long and over 200 pounds. They can quickly grow past that size if they are the single Grick Alpha in the colony of them. Alphas are large, um, over 10 feet long, and they use their size to make a whipping attack with their tail. With a reach of 10 feet, this can be quite effective as an attack if they grip the roof of a cavern, cave, mine, or rocky outcrop, even the ceiling of a dungeon. Um, they they can then smash the tail right into the head of a victim passing underneath them before dropping down onto the floor and launching into a savage attack. Gricks are very hard to see when they are concealed in rocky terrain. While they appear to be greenish or even blue in some depictions of them, the upper body is actually rough and drab.
drab, a very mottled and rocky appearance that blends into the terrain quite well. They've got a lighter underbelly, which is normally um, a, a more sort of pale olive. So they have quite an advantage on their stealth checks, and a typical encounter with them will usually start with a surprise round, which is where they do the most damage. Bricks have a speed of around 30 feet on the ground or climbing up walls and across ceilings. So they have, um, they're very agile in their underdark terrain and of course they can squeeze their bodies into quite tight spaces. They have dark vision out to 60 feet but they don't have eyes. They can uh, taste the air like a snake and have heat sensing pits as well as sensitivity to air movement. They see all non gricks as food and will attack anything that moves, backing off only if it harms them or it's clearly not food. So it is possible for them to learn to not attack golems and warforged for instance but they will try and eat the undead since they survive quite well by eating carrion. Gricks can be found infesting caves, dungeons, city sewers, mountain passes, mines, even particularly squalid city streets where the predominant structural material is stone. So they, uh, if you find that a lot of your rats and other vermin is going missing, it may be that the Gricks are in fact moving into the area and growing in size and population rapidly. They can also be found infesting the lair of beholders, lurking close to drow, dragon and goblin territory. They will be drawn to the stinking larders of troglodytes, trolls and grimlocks. They infest the stalks and caps of huge underground fungus and will be drawn to feast on the body of any large huge underdark creature that dies and starts to decompose much like starfish and crabs are drawn to the bodies of decomposing animals on the sea floor. Grix will attempt to drag prey down and away to some safe crevice where they can take their time to feed on it. The beaks are not very powerful and it takes them a bit of time to break up a body into chunks that they can swallow down easily. They don't keep treasure or make lairs, they are only interested in feeding and breeding. So they will not leave an area until it is uh, that is rich in food, unless something drives them away or until they've eaten all their food in the area and start to starve. You'll only find treasure around them if they've been feeding on for some time on creatures that may have treasure on them when they got murdered and eaten. Grick's rubbery, worm-like flesh is not poisonous, but it's very tough. It has a disgusting smell and texture and taste, plus it's almost indigestible. The squid-like beaks are about the only thing that can be salvaged from the corpse, and sometimes you can find them carved decoratively like some sort of underdark scrimshaw. Uh, Grix, there's no reason I think that Grix could not grow to quite enormous size in the optimum conditions. The Grix alphas in particular could grow to be really really huge. Um, there's nothing in the monster manual or, or otherwise that says this is the case but also there's nothing in there that says that's not the case. So if you encountered some sort of enormous Grix it could be quite a threatening situation particularly if it's got like thousands of Grix which are squirming around it um, and feeding on any of its, uh, its the, of the large kills that it brings down and yeah so it could be quite a situation in the Underdark where you would come across Gricks in huge numbers particularly if it's an area that's uh, spawning lots of like aberrations and things like that there's some sort of open portal where aberrations and um, oozes and things are pouring through and the Gricks are just feasting on anything that they can get their grubby little tentacles on. They are of course quite threatening to low level adventurers who don't have magical items or who haven't thought to equip themselves with lamp oil or alchemical fire or alchemical cold um, an encounter with Gricks in that particular case you've got to be careful about the numbers of Gricks that you throw against them. They might be able to handle one or two, uh, perhaps even trap it, um, maybe even take it back to town to sell it as some sort of curiosity or abhorrent thing that they've found in the Underdark that they can trade. Um, otherwise of course it can tear the crap out of them pretty quickly. Their, their bite attacks are quite weak but those tentacle attacks are nothing to be sniffed at. So have a care when you use them against low level adventurers. The uh, the listing that we have in the dungeon, uh, the uh, monster manual, the Grick Alpha is a challenge rating 7. It's a fairly weak challenge rating 7 though. It's got a armor class of 18, only 75 hit points, but of course that bludgeoning and piercing slashing from non-magical weapons is usually not going to be very effective against um characters of that level or close to it. Um, the stone camouflage is pretty useful and yeah otherwise they're very they're quite simple to run as an encounter and I would definitely recommend them for people who are just starting out and looking for some sort of quick and easy cave or cavern or mountain pass um, encounter with these nasty little beasties and they are a dungeon classic for just that reason. Um, they're very easy to run and they're ubiquitous you can find them just about anywhere. 
they are monstrosities. They're not aberrations. So they they are actually natural creatures um, that uh, that are part of the predatory um, ecology of the underdark. Usually the upper underdark, um, where you can find these things crawling around, um, but possibly the middle underdark. And the lower underdark, they would be quickly taken out by other larger, more aggressive predators. Thanks for listening, everybody. I will be back with more stuff for you very soon. Uh, just a reminder, if you've not subscribed already, feel free to do so. Give me that uh, um, notification bell when you do so, so you can watch my videos when they pop up as I'm uh, living in New Zealand and upload at different times of the day from um, from regular people. Also, uh, check out my Patreon if you want to become a patron of the channel. Um, I've just uploaded an exclusive video for those uh, patrons where I revealed what was whispered in the Alip video. Uh, so yeah, that's of interest. If you're a patron and you haven't checked that out yet, feel free. Um, also, come and check out the Discord server uh, if you want to come and say hi to me and ask me some questions directly. I try and get on there um, several times a week. So uh, yeah, that's a good way. And also, um, I'll be doing some gaming on there in the future as well. Thanks for listening, everyone. I'll catch you again soon.